Right. Um, so, all right, your mics are off, but be sure and turn them on. If you want to ask a question, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, otherwise, I'm just talking to myself. Um, this is Southport Armchair History, and I'm Liz Fuller, and our topic today is Prohibition and Smuggling in Southport. This is the fifth and final session in our five-part series on early 20th century Southport history. It's being presented in collaboration with Harper Library and Friends of the Library, Southport and Oak Island. So, so far we've talked about how the people of Southport dealt with the challenges of war and a pandemic. Uh, we've discussed how even before the women had the right to vote, the women of Southport worked to improve their town and how against many barriers, they continue to work for voting rights. And then last week we talked about the culture of moonshining and what it meant in terms of independence and ingenuity and self-sufficiency to the people of North Carolina. So finally, in this last session, we're going to talk about prohibition and how the citizens of Southport set high standards for themselves and for their community. Uh, somebody's mic is on, so if you can just check your mics. So um, this is our, our timeline for this week. Um, and as you can see, national prohibition was from 1919 through 1933. But if we're going to talk about prohibition in Southport, we have to start a lot earlier and we have to go a lot longer. So deciding to eliminate all liquor sales in a, in a, for a city is a really big decision. And after our discussion of moonshining last week, you might be wondering, well, just when and why did Southport go dry? The first instance I could find of Southport attempting to outlaw liquor was way back in 1871. So if we think about Southport at that time, it was a small kind of rough little village surrounding a fort. There were about 1,500 people living here. About half of them were former slaves um, or soldiers. So basically the citizens of Southport were living under military occupation. And there was a clash of really three or four even different cultures because you had not just the, um, the, the white citizens of the town, you had the, the formerly enslaved people, you had the soldiers, and then you also had the uh, northerners, the carpetbaggers who had moved south. So there were four cultures kind of all trying to live in pro close proximity to each other. And we know that there were some fights that broke out, um, some of them at political gatherings, um, and there was at least one riot that uh, the troops got involved in. And we can kind of assume that there was drinking involved in those incidents. Um, in fact, in the, the, some of the newspaper accounts, they even mentioned that drinking had been a precursor to those incidents. So I think that the people of Southport, you know, like I said, they were, they were under military rule, they were occupied. They were trying to take some control over what was going on in their community and uh, in their lives. So one way they thought about doing that was if they could outlaw liquor, maybe that would solve some of the the problems that they were seeing and, and reduce some of the public drunkenness. They weren't able to, uh, to make it dry in 1871. Um, in 1880, there was a temperance group that started and there were people in the town who voluntarily promised to give up drinking and cussing. And they signed petitions that said they would do that. That same year, 100 women in Southport signed a petition to outlaw liquor and they sent it up to the, to the government. So I would have loved to see both of those rosters, who signed saying that they would stop drinking and the, who, which women uh, were bold enough to sign that petition. But unfortunately, neither of those documents still exist. But uh, by 1887, North Carolina legislature had adopted something called the local option. And that meant that local communities could decide for themselves whether or not to allow al alcohol. And so Southport quickly took advantage of this new law and they voted immediately to outlaw liquor in town. And that lasted about 12 years. And then it seemed like the town started toying with the idea that maybe they could handle liquor after all. So they started issuing, the Board of Aldermen would issue uh, some temporary licenses. So there was a butcher, uh, his name was B.F. Greer, he had a butcher shop and he would 
uh, he would get a temporary license of maybe 15 to 30 days where he could sell cider. And there was also a store near the garrison. It was called Westcott Store. It was run by a man named J.B. Fountain. And he could also get periodic licenses. Now, right before, in 1899, he got a, a little more ambitious and he tried to get permission to sell cider up until 10 o'clock on Saturday nights. But uh, the Board of Aldermen said, no, that's, that's too much. But then finally in 1901, the town voted to allow liquor. They decided they would try it again and they approved two saloons in town. Um, we don't know exactly what happened except that that only lasted two years and then the next chance that they had to vote for local option, they did vote it in. Uh, by a margin of three to one, Southport opted to go dry and it stayed dry for a long, long time for decades. So they finally decided, nope, we can't handle it after all. And I find it kind of interesting that three to one vote because uh, we know women didn't have the right to vote at that point and the African Americans, the vote had been taken away from them at that point. So it was really the white men in town voted three to one to, um, to approve uh, prohibition and to go dry. So that was in 1903. Um, five years later, North Carolina followed Southport's lead and the entire state went dry. In fact, North Carolina was the first state in the South to vote itself dry instead of having it be established by the legislature. So it wasn't a rule that came down from on high. The people themselves said that they wanted to go dry. Uh, at that time in the country, there were only about eight or nine states that were dry. And it would be another 11 years before the entire United States followed North Carolina's lead. Now, one thing that's important to realize when North Carolina went dry originally, Virginia and South Carolina still sold alcohol. So even though it wasn't being sold in North Carolina, people could go across the border. They could go to Virginia, they could go to South Carolina, and they could purchase it. And if they weren't able to travel, they could also buy it by mail. So as you can see, here's some uh, mail order opportunities where people could have it delivered to their house. So this had the advantage for North Carolina where there were no saloons, there was no drinking at public gatherings, no drinking at political meetings, um, and there was no public drunkenness. But at the same time, people who had the means could still manage to have alcohol. But it was limited to only people who were, could afford to travel out of state or could have it delivered to them by mail. And that's kind of consistent. As you see, you'll see as we go through this that in a lot of ways, prohibition has always been not as much about getting rid of all alcohol, but keeping it out of the hands of certain people. So it seems like the people in charge always thought, well, I can handle it, but I'm not so sure about them or about you. So what were the main drivers of prohibition in North Carolina? In many instances, it was very similar to the, to the movement in the rest of the country. And we'll look at each of these uh, one by one. So the first thing you think of in North Carolina are the churches and the Methodists and the Baptists were very much against drinking and they had a strong influence in North Carolina. They were a strong driver for, uh, for prohibition in North Carolina. Both the Baptist State Convention and the North Carolina Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church were in support of prohibition. There was also the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So this is a picture of Carrie Nation. She's probably the most easily recognized member of the WCTU, even though she was kind of a fringe element. She, she got the most publicity. She was the one uh, that you think about that would, got fed up and she went around busting up saloons with her hatchet. Uh, but the WCTU actually was a, a, a serious organization. It was the, um, the largest women's organization in America's history up to 1911. They had 245,000 members. And, um, they, they had some, uh, they were, they're sort of portrayed as being these sourpusses that just wanted to, to stop people's fun and stop them from drinking. But they actually had some very solid reasons that they were against uh, drinking. What had happened was the country was in the process of, of changing from being a, a rural country with a, a lot of farming to becoming an industrialized country. And when that happened, it really changed a lot of things that you don't normally think about. But if you think about the way things are managed on a farm and the way money is managed on the farm, you know, there's not a paycheck that comes in every week. You may get your money 
once a year when you, you butcher the hogs or you, you, your crop is, is uh, you harvest your crop and you sell it, then you get an influx of money. But you've been living on credit all, all year, so that most of that money goes back to people that you borrowed from at the stores and you have a little bit of money. Any um, alcohol that you have is really homegrown and homemade, and so you just have that stock of it, but you're not going out and buying it. It's, and so things are, there's not these highs and lows. But in an industrialized um, society, when people were moving to work in factories, the men would work all week and they'd get a paycheck on Fridays. They would take their paycheck, they would take it to a saloon to cash it. Then they'd sit down and have a drink and then they'd have another drink and then they'd have another drink. And before you know it, they had drunk most or all of their paycheck. And so then they wouldn't have anything left over to bring home to their wife and children. So their wives and children were uh, at risk of eviction, they were at risk of starvation, the men would come home drunk, they were violent, there was a uh, risk of abuse, domestic abuse wasn't illegal back then, it wasn't illegal to beat your children, um, there was no such thing as marital rape, all those things could go on and the women had no recourse because um, divorce really wasn't an option, it wasn't, there really wasn't much divorce, a lot of women uh, couldn't work or, or weren't allowed to own property. So the WCTU looked at this whole situation and what was going on, and they, they looked and said, well, the root cause is the drinking. If the men couldn't drink, they couldn't take their check to a saloon and cash it there, they would bring their paycheck home to their wives, everybody would be sober, everybody would be happy, and none of this, and nobody would be at risk of starvation or eviction. So they were trying to, to um, manage the root cause of that. Um, and they, even though they didn't have the right to vote, they had learned through um, abolition movements, women had learned that they could change things uh, by working in numbers. So uh, you see a lot of things we saw before the women's uh, right to vote, women were working together in large numbers, the same thing with abolition and also with the WCTU. So they were finding even without the vote that they had a strength when they all worked together. Another factor in North Carolina were white supremacists. Um, yeah. I, want to stop, I want to stop you for a minute. I have a, a message that says that the audio is, is skipping. Uh, I, I want to ask folks if, if they're experiencing that to unmute and let us, let us know. Um, otherwise, it, it, it may be a local, a local problem. It's been fine for me. Okay. Fine for me. It's fine for me. Okay. Okay. What, it's fine uh, for me. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bob, could you just mute everybody and then turn my mic back on? Because sometimes it's that somebody has a mic on and it's it's going in and out. Okay, hold on. Does anybody have any questions? Of course, now he's muting everybody. <laughs> Can you hear me, Liz? Yeah. This is Larry. I have a question for you. Sure, Larry. What's up? Um, it's, it's kind of, when, when I hear you speak of the men going out to the bars and drinking their paychecks away. I'm sure not but, everybody. I wasn't trying well, to. Well, I, I meant that, you know, widely. Uh, uh, um, I'm curious about the alcohol made then. Um, was it overseen and you couldn't produce? anything but maybe 40% uh, alcohol, like we have such regulations on it now, but back then could it have been any amount of alcohol and some of that stuff was like maybe 50, 60%? Um, you know, I have read, yeah. You like that, I mean, you got really tore up with less alcohol than you would today is, is, is the point I would be driving at. Yeah, there was a lot stronger alcohol because when you go back in the early parts of the, of the country, um, in the early eras, you know, you, you'll hear about people drinking all the time because the water wasn't good, right? So people would drink um, beer a lot. Or so, but what they were drinking and like a lot of what they were drinking on the farms was much lower alcohol content. Um, you're right. Some of what was being manufactured at that point was higher alcohol content. And people weren't used to that. So um, that was that was a, a difference. Thank you. Okay, um, so we were talking about white supremacy. <laughs> we had um, Fernifold Simmons, 
was a U.S. Senator from North Carolina. He was a Senator for 30 years. He uh, ran on his um, platform of white supremacy and um, he's the longest running um, senator that we, the longest serving senator that we've ever had in North Carolina. And in addition, Josephus Daniels was the owner of the Raleigh newspaper and he was also um, a, very, a very public white supremacist. So both of these men um, were proponents of prohibition in part because they didn't want African Americans to be drinking. In particular, Fernifold Simmons was interested in shutting down rural distilleries which he referred to as Republican recruiting stations. So he was Democrat as were most of the people in um, North Carolina and most of the, the blacks and the uh, uh, northerners were Republican. And so, um, so that was one of, their, um, one of their motivations. Josephus Daniels ended up being appointed the Secretary of the Navy under President Wilson. So he was very consistent in his views because as soon as he became the Secretary of Navy, he immediately abolished alcohol on all the Navy ships and the military bases. And this was a good five years before the rest of the country went dry. So I'm not sure how popular he was with his men, but at least he uh, was consistent. So then we have the railroads and the textile industries. Those were two major employers in North Carolina. They wanted prohibition because they wanted a sober workforce. They didn't want to deal with drunk employees, hungover employees, or the injuries and absenteeism that came with that. Uh, in, in fact, many railroad camps were already dry because they would not allow their workers to drink in the work environment. So we had all these different groups, but really none of them alone would have been strong enough to pass prohibition without the Anti-Saloon League. This was an extremely powerful lobby. In fact, it's the most powerful single issue lobby that this country has ever had. So, you know, you can think of big lobbyist groups now, big tobacco, big pharma, um, uh, the NRA, all of those. This was the most powerful uh, lobby that we've ever had. They had money, they had political savvy, they had determination, and they didn't, they wanted liquor outlaw and they didn't care who they got into bed with in order to make it happen. So you had all of these different groups, they had slightly different motivations, but they all came together sort of in a, a perfect storm and they helped get prohibition passed in North Carolina. Liz? Yes. Yeah, I, I just have a tough time wrapping my uh, head around, you, you go, I guess maybe you can give a perspective of what a, what a typical paycheck would be and what, what a, a beer would be at that time. I mean, to, to spend your entire paycheck in, you know, in one sitting seems to me to be, uh, I'm just having a tough time with it. Well, and I, you know, that's, maybe it was, uh, was a little bit of hyperbole, but they were, they were certainly spending um, money at the saloons. They were, um, they were getting paid weekly, so it wasn't a lot. Um, and, um, they were certainly spending more than they should and more than what um, was, was going to feed, have enough left over to feed their, um, their kids and pay the rent. Hey, Liz. That's sort of in general. Go ahead, Kim. I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt, but I have something to contribute about that. Um, my grandmother, the one married to Grandpa Ernest Bland, Grandma Bale, she um, grew up in Columbus County, an area called, uh, it's called, uh, Freeland now, but it was called Kingtown, and her father was an alcoholic, and that was something that her and her sister said. Um, he had put in tobacco, and her and her sister, they were hoping to get new clothes, and after they sold the tobacco, and instead of bringing the money home, they, her uh, father and the brothers, they all drank it away is what I was always told, they, you know, quotations, they drank it away. So she told her sister, if I have to get married to get out of here, I'm going to do it. And that's what forced her into her first marriage when she was very young. It's just wanting a better life. So, okay. And my, my great grandfather was a saloon owner in, um, in New York state. Um, and I know that uh, at one, at least one point, there was a, one of his patrons, the wife had posted at the saloons in town, it was a small town, but they posted, um, do not serve my husband any more alcohol because, you know, they, uh, I need him to bring home his paycheck. So she'd gone around and told the different um, saloons that. So 
you know, I, I'm sure it was not true of everybody, but it was true of enough that the, um, the WCTU felt that it was a problem, whether it was, um, you know, drinking all the money or coming home drunk and being abusive, um, and just that the women didn't have any recourse. So, um, you know, I'm sure there's, it's, it, it, there's, there's truth in there, whether it's exactly they drank all of their paycheck every single Friday. Does that help, David? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm sure it wasn't everybody. I'm not trying to malign all, all the men that were working there at those factories. Okay, so there were all these different um, lobbyist groups, religious groups, uh, industrial groups that uh, had reasons for wanting prohibition. And then across the country, there was another motivation, and that had to do with um, uh, immigration. And this was um, a larger problem across the country than it really was in North Carolina. Um, so this chart on the left shows the uh, increase in immigration decade by decade. And as you'll see in, uh, from 1901 to 1910, there was a big upsurge. And there was also an upsurge in um, 1911 to 1920. I'm having trouble reading my own slide. In the first 20 years of, um, of the century, the reason that that second decade is lower than the, fr than the first decade is because of the war. So a lot of the immigration was coming from Europe. It would have continued coming, except that the, uh, you know, World War I broke out and that stopped the immigration. So there was a lot of immigration that came into the country during that time period. The, the um, chart on the right is a comparison of the, of the raw numbers of immigrants that came into the country. Uh, the bottom bar represents the number that came in in the 40 years between 1861 and 1900. The top bar shows how many came in in the first 20 years of the 20th century from 1901 to 1920. So the country was seeing a lot of immigration. There was nearly 15 million immigrants that came in during that time period. So it was, um, that was a, a bigger influx than they had seen before. In addition, the immigrants uh, were from different countries than they had been before. Be prior to that, most of the immigration had come in from English-speaking countries, a lot of it from um, the United Kingdom. They had similar, um, uh, similar language, similar uh, religions, similar culture, and so they were assimilated a little bit more easily. Um, obviously, the Irish were not as assimilated quite as easily, like my great-grandfather. Um, but the, the shift was to another part of Europe, and so we started seeing um, immigrants coming in from, um, uh, from Italy, from Poland, from Russia, from other countries that um, were non-English speaking, um, had different uh, religions, had different cultures, they looked different and they acted different. And this was quite concerning to the people uh, at the time. They, they felt like these were not um, as nice of immigrants to come in. They didn't feel, they didn't approve of them as much. And so this was the, um, the progressive era and they had a lot of ideas about how they could fix things and how they could improve things. And one of the ways that they thought they could fix this was to try and Americanize these immigrants as quickly as possible and efficiently as possible. So they, they said about teaching them English and they tried to encourage them to abandon their old traditions and their old ways of life and to embrace the American mainstream culture. And including, they tried to get them to reduce their, their cultural and religious traditions of drinking. So I'm sure that there were many people who genuinely believed that by outlawing alcohol, they were going to make the country a better place. I mean, obviously they believed that they wouldn't have passed an entire constitutional amendment if they didn't think it was going to make the country better. But if you follow some of these beliefs to their logical conclusions, it leads to a very dark side of this movement. So I mentioned in a previous class that um, this period spawned a second wave of the Ku Klux Klan. And we think of the Klan as operating after the Civil War in the South, and they did. Um, but by, the by 1900, they had some, a lot of it had died down because they'd reached a lot of their goals. The, the African-Americans had lost their, um, their right to vote. They had, um, they, there was segregation going on. They were in subservient positions. So there wasn't as much, um, much concerns. But then with the rise in immigration, the Klan actually started rising up again and there was a revival. 
And this time it wasn't limited to the South, it was across the entire country, it was in the North as well. In fact, the largest membership was in Indiana. And remember I said the Anti-Saloon League was a powerful lobby, they were willing to get into bed with anyone and as long as they were against drinking. And so they also had close ties to the KKK. And the Klan really targeted the drinking of, of those that they identified as uh, enemies of 100% Americanism. So they were against Catholics, they were against immigrants, and they were against African Americans. And they were often able to gain a foothold in the white Protestant evangelical communities because they promised to uh, restore family values. They promised to be the, the ones who could put bootleggers and moonshiners out of business. If you remember last week, we talked about how the federal government said that moonshining was against the law, but they really didn't put much money behind it. They didn't give the, the police a lot of uh, to go on in order to enforce those laws. And a lot of times there wasn't an appetite in the police to enforce those laws. So the Klan said, well, then we'll do it. Um, and particular, in particular, they went after people that were in these groups that they, um, that they were, uh, didn't approve of. And sometimes they even had the support of the local government because, again, they, they didn't have the manpower to clean these things up. So it became a very popular organization at that time. Uh, it ex the membership exploded to between four and six million members. So if you see this cartoon on the, the right, that's actually from um, a KKK handbook or magazine, you know, that's went out to its members. Um, and it's a parody of um, St. Patrick being uh, driving the snakes out of Ireland. Instead, we see the, the Klan we, uh, driving St. Patrick out of the country. We see the American flag, the burning cross. It says America, and he's holding the staff saying St. Patrick's. They're, they're driving him and his snakes out, and they list in the snakes what the different things stand for, and I find it interesting that without any sense of irony, they, one of the snakes says intolerance on it. And they're driving that out. Um, You'll also see, notice on the other side that those, uh, those clans people that are marching are actually women. And this was the first time that the KKK, um, the women joined the KKK. And it's because of their rhetoric where they were promising to promote family values. Um, and they were seen as the protectors, um, they would, these vigilantes who would ward off the foreigners who were moving into our land and trying to change our way of life. So in addition to all of that going on, um, the, the country was also preparing to go to war. And so the coming of World War I made uh, prohibition patriotic. It was more important to use grain to feed the troops overseas. Just like after the civil, during the Civil War, they were saying, let's not use corn to make whiskey or to make, yeah, let's use it to, uh, to feed the troops. They were saying, let's use grain to make bread to feed our boys overseas. In addition to that, the majority of beer manufacturers were German. So you had Budweiser, Anheuser, Busch, Schlitz, um, all of those were German. And of course we were getting ready to go to war with Germany. So drinking beer was seen as supporting the enemy. So with all those many different factions wanting prohibition, um, then the question is, well, who, who was uh, against it? Who's left to be against prohibition? So it really was um, the liquor industry, um, and they, in North Carolina, they, they, um, there wasn't much opposition against prohibition. That's why it, it happened so early. But nationally, the liquor industry was very strong, and uh, so in anybody tangentially related to the liquor industry, so you had saloon owners, you had the, the, the manufacturers, you had the people that drove the trucks, all those people were against it. Um, the working class men who, uh, needed to go to a saloon in order to drink because they didn't have, you know, a wine cellar or a, a you know, a stockpile of alcohol. They depended on going to their saloon um, every week. And so they were all against it. And then oddly enough, doctors were against it. It's not that they were for drinking. Um, they were against alcoholism, obviously, but alcohol was one of the few medicines that they had that they could prescribe. And they didn't like the legislature telling them, uh, how much they could give to people and when they could give it to people and making basically medical decisions. So those were the groups that, um, that were against it. Now, the liquor industry felt pretty secure. They never thought the country would do away with the 
with liquor altogether. They didn't think that they would uh, implement prohibition. And the reason for that is that the country was basically funded by the liquor industry. At that time, 40% of the US revenue came from the liquor industry. So they were like, we're too big to fail. You need us. We're too, you're too dependent on us. And so they were pretty confident. But then in 1913, a constitutional amendment came along that basically paved the way for prohibition. Does anyone know what, constitution, what amendment happened in 1913? I think some of you know, but uh, we won't be saying. So, all right, I will tell you. It was the 16th Amendment, and it's established the income tax. So with the implementation of the income tax, the federal government suddenly had a new source of revenue, and it was no longer as dependent on the money from the liquor industry, and suddenly prohibition was an option. So I want you to um, think for a moment and pretend for a moment that you're a member of Congress and your constituents are telling you that they want prohibition. And so you need to write up an amendment to make this change. So I want you to think to yourself as you write this amendment, what are the things you're going to outlaw? Okay, and you can make a little note to yourself or you can try to remember uh, for the next slide when I tell you what they actually did. So would you outlaw selling it? buying it, making it, transporting it, owning it, or and consuming it. Of those, which would you think would be, should be against the law? And would you outlaw just liquor or also wine or, or beer? And would you make exceptions for medicinal uses, uses or sacramental purposes? Okay, does everybody kind of have an idea what you would do? I will tell you what they did. So four years after the amendment to um, start the income tax, uh, we had the 18th Amendment, and it was submitted to the Constitution, to, uh, uh, was submitted to be ratified to the states in 1919, and it went in effect in January of 1920, so uh, just about 100 years ago today. So here's how they did it. They outlawed making it, selling it, transporting it, and importing or exporting it. But they left it alone. It was perfectly legal to buy it, to own it, or to consume it. So as you can see, if you are a member of Congress and you have some money, um, you could continue to, to buy alcohol, to own it, and to consume it. Um, but you and without breaking the law the people that would be breaking the law would be the ones that are making it or selling it to you or transporting it so it was very cleverly worded so the the amendment um, changed what the overall law of the land was but they needed laws underneath that to um, to that they could enforce so um, they came up with the Volstead Act and the Volstead Act determined uh, things that the, that the uh, amendment left out. So the amendment just says intoxicating liquors. Um, but the Volstead Act actually defined what intoxicating liquors was. And it was anything with more than half a percent of alcohol. Now that was kind of surprising to a lot of people because when they were voting for prohibition and, and lobbying for it to, to happen, a lot of them thought that what they were outlawing was liquor. And as Larry had said, very strong spirits. That's what they thought they were getting rid of. They didn't really expect it to come all the way down to nothing more than half a percent of alcohol, you know, which includes things like beer. Um, so, and then they put together this Volstead Act and that defined what it was, and it also, um, it, but what it didn't do was provide enough funding to enforce the laws. So the, the, the uh, police really didn't have enough funding to, to handle all these new crimes that were going to be happening. And because what, what they were outlawing was the sale and manufacture of untaxed liquor, they decided to put it under the jurisdiction of the Internal Revenue Service because it was lost revenue. So that's why you're always hearing about the revenue men or the revenuers being the ones looking for stills. Now, the one exception that they did keep was that uh, you could buy liquor for medicinal purposes uh, when it's prescribed by a physician, or you can use it in religious services. 
Now, North Carolina, not to be outdone, which has always been stricter, a few years later, they put into a law something called the Turlington Act, and they made it illegal to manufacture, to sell, to barter, to transport, to import, to export, to deliver, to furnish, to purchase or possess intoxicating liquor. About the only thing left in there is the consuming it, but you'd have to consume it without actually owning it or, um, uh, or purchasing it um, or having anybody. So I guess somebody could furnish it to you and uh, you'd have to drink it right away before you actually owned it. The only uh, exceptions they had were for sacra religious sacramental purposes and medical uses. So at that time, if you wanted to get alcohol legally, what you had to do was you had to go to your doctor and you had to ask for a prescription. Now, there was a long list of ailments that it could be prescribed for. That's a prescription pad up in the corner there in the slide. And you'll see underneath it is medicinal whiskey. You'll notice it's 100 proof. So I'm hoping that they didn't uh, consume that straight. You could go to your doctor, get a prescription for things like the flu, arthritis, uh, or old age. Then you could take that prescription uh, to your pharmacy to get it filled. Now the prescription was only good once and it was limited to uh, one pint of this medicinal whiskey every 10 days. So it cost about $3 to go to the doctor and it cost about another $3 um, for the whiskey. So that's about $40 in today's currency. Um, for each of those $3 is $40. So it'd be about $80 every 10 days. So again, as you can see, that was a, that was a sizable amount of money. Um, and so it was only a solution for people who had that kind of disposable income. Uh, moonshine, as long as you didn't get caught, was a lot less expensive. That picture in the, in the middle, that picture, that gray picture, is a picture of the window of Southport's pharmacy at the time. It was called Watson's Pharmacy, uh, named after the local druggist, D.I. Watson. And you'll remember him from our class on the flu pandemic. Uh, he's the one that wrote the article for the newspapers that said, you know, suggested that people from Wilmington not come to Southport, people from Southport not come to Wilmington during the, the flu pandemic, and that they only uh, conduct urgent business between the two towns. So he owned the pharmacy. This is a picture of Watson's pharmacy in the 1960s, the one on the left. As you can see, it included a soda fountain. And then uh, here's a picture on the right is um, from three years ago when it was a restaurant called the pharmacy. So it's no longer called the pharmacy. Does anyone recognize uh, what it is today? You've probably been in it. The oyster bar. The oyster bar, right. Very good, it is the oyster bar. And someday soon, hopefully we will all be there again. Liz, I have a question. I mean, with the with the uh, religious exemption, did did you know uh, new kinds of religion crop up so they could you could drink? <laughs> That's interesting. I don't think so. I think it was just for ceremonial purposes. I haven't heard of that. I don't know if anybody else has heard of that. Um, I think it was just for communion. Was was basically the idea of it. Um, yeah. I'm thinking yeah. there's, a, that, there's a loophole they could have used. But. That is a loophole. Yeah, they could. I don't think that. Yeah, I don't. I, I haven't heard of that. Liz, it did keep the uh, wine industry alive. If you've ever been on a California wine tour, they talk about the Sacramento use keeping them alive. Right, right, and also the medicinal use. Um, some distilleries could produce medicinal use. There's a a great story about a man in um, West Virginia, Ohio area that bought up all of the distilleries around there and started producing um, uh, alcohol for medicinal use. And then what he would do is he would, when he was transporting it, he'd have it in his trucks, his drivers, and as it would be transported, he would arrange for his drivers to be ambushed and uh, have the liquor stolen. And then that was used, then they sold it um, you know, uh, on the black market. So he kind of had both sides covered. He was a very uh, colorful character. So, but yes, yeah, so those were the two, those were the only things that were left were the, 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 um, the, the wine being, being done for sacramental purposes and the liquor being produced for uh, medicinal purposes. Liz? Yes. Uh, this is Rich. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, I lived out in California for quite some time. The California wine industry during Prohibition, a lot of them, a lot of the 
uh, growers and producers of wine actually produced grape stock, it was called, and they would ship it in large quantities to Chicago okay. to people you might think would be interested in that. And right. Chicago had a law, and I don't know whether it was across the country, you, you were allowed to make so much uh, wine or alcohol for yourself, for your own consumption, not to be sold. So the component uh, uh, folks would have all the people in the neighborhoods making wine or booze from this great stock. Um, and uh, they were allowed to make so many gallons. So yeah. then they would collect that and then sell it. So. That's interesting. I haven't looked into the, to, um, that aspect of it, but it's, that's interesting. Um, okay, so as we said, the um, moonshine, th those were the only sources of alcohol in the country was either this, um, you know, if, it was, if they, they stole the, the um, medicinal liquor or um, the grape stock like Rich was describing, um, or moonshine, those are the really the only sources of American alcohol that was going on at that time. But there was another source of alcohol, and that was alcohol being smuggled in from other countries. And because Southport is on the coast, um, it was uniquely situated so that there was alcohol coming in from the sea. So the way this would work is that the, the jurisdiction uh, national waters goes out about three miles, and beyond that, it's international waters. So uh, the Coast Guard had had jurisdiction over that initial um, stretch of water, but then after that, it was international. So large ships would would come up from um, from the UK, from South America, from Canada. They would station themselves beyond that, um, just beyond that three mile limit, and they would be like floating warehouses. They would be full of liquor and they would position themselves there. And then at night, there were smaller boats called rum runners. And the rum runners would uh, go out and meet these boats uh, out in, in the water. They would load up with alcohol and then uh, they would try to slip back in uh, with, under the cover of darkness without the Coast Guard noticing them and bring this, the alcohol to shore where they would meet up with bootleggers who would then take it on into the towns. So that's the way the system would work. Now, um, as we talked about last week, the bootleggers would often um, soup up their cars to make them really fast. Um, the, the rum runners would do the same thing. They would try to modify their boats to make them really fast so that they could run away from the law. Now, last week I mentioned that the government, uh, the police, everybody were at a disadvantage because they didn't have money to soup up their cars. They just used the government issue. And so uh, in a lot of cases, the bootlegging cars were a lot more powerful. The, um, the Coast Guard had a little bit of an advantage with the rum runners because they had boats called rum chasers. Now, this was right after World War I, and there were actually World War I military surplus boats that were converted into rum chasers. They had 180 horsepower engines. They could cruise at 20 miles per hour. If you see, if you'll notice on the front of this boat, that's a machine gun that is attached to the front of the boat. They would have a three-man crew. They would also have four rifles and four automatic handguns. So they meant business. So because the, um, the rum chasers were not as, as fast as the, I mean, the rum runners were not as fast as the rum chasers, they sometimes, the smugglers sometimes had to be um, devious or clever in order to try to get their, uh, their liquor to land. So there was one instance in 1930 um, when the Coast Guard received a distress call from the, the frying pan light ship. The frying pan light ship is stationed offshore off of Bald Head in the frying pan shoals. It's like a floating lighthouse and it sits out there to try to prevent shipwrecks. So it, uh, they got a, a distress call from the frying pan light ship. So a cutter from Oak Island and a Coast Guard buoy tender from Charleston immediately took off to go and try to help the people on the, the, the light ship. So as they were charging there, they radioed that they were on their way to not worry, they'd be there soon. And the light ship said, we don't know what you're talking about. We didn't radio for help. And so that's when they realized that they had been duped. 
So they turned around and they went racing back in the other direction uh, to find out what was, was going on. And uh, they ended up um, capturing a British schooner that was trying to slip past them and it had 976 cases of Canadian liquor that they were trying to get through. Now there's a woman who uh, used to live in Southport, she went to high school here and during, during Prohibition and she used to tell a story, her name was Laverne Goodman Redder, she used to tell a story about how her father inadvertently aided some rum runners one time. It seems that he had built a boat uh, a large boat, and in order to power it, he had taken the engine out of their touring car, like the one you see on the, the left there. He had taken that engine and he had put it in the boat, and it was very fast. And so not too long after he had made this boat, um, two men showed up. They'd seen it running on the river, and they came uh, to visit him, and they offered him a lot of money for the boat. Now, perhaps he should have been suspicious, he said later they were driving a fancy car and that they were dressed like millionaires. But, you know, money was money and it was in pretty short supply in those days. And so if they wanted his boat, he was going to sell it to them. So a few days later, he, he was sitting on his porch and looking out at the river and suddenly he sees his boat, the one he'd sold to these gentlemen, racing up the river. And he watched it go and he was like, wow, it really is fast. And then uh, right after it, he saw a, a, a Coast Guard boat chasing up after it, and he watched very carefully because he wanted to see had he built a boat fast enough to outrun the, uh, the Coast Guard, uh, but he hadn't. And so the Coast Guard managed to, uh, to catch the boat, uh, and they took it up to Wilmington to auction it off. And so Mr. Redder um, went on up to Wilmington out of curiosity just to see how much the boat would go for and to see if he could find out any of the story. And he ended up finding out that his boat had been bought, uh, part, bought to be used as part of an operation smuggling booze into the country from South America. So meanwhile, the country was becoming a little disenchanted with prohibition. Uh, the government had lost $11 billion in tax revenue. They'd spent $300 million enforcing the law. Thousands of jobs had been lost at breweries, at saloons, at distilleries that had all been shut down. Now, when they uh, implemented prohibition, they thought that when they banned alcohol sales, that that money would then be turned into, um, it would boost sales of, of other entertainments like restaurants and things like that, and the theater. Um, but in, in fact, those sales declined. Uh, people didn't use it the way that they had money that they, the way they thought they would. Now, overall drinking had gone down. So in some uh, ways it, it was successful. It had reduced the drinking, but it also had changed who was drinking. Before prohibition, women really didn't drink and they certainly didn't drink in public. Um, but with the whole um, atmosphere that was going on then and speakeasies, it became sort of glamorous for women to drink. And so more women drank than before. They invented cocktails to make it uh, smoother, easier to, to, uh, to drink the alcohol. And it became a little more glamorous and fashionable. In addition, crime rates had risen. Um, of course, you know, you think of the, the, the big crime, the mob crime and organized crime and all of that. But it was also people who uh, would never have broken the law before suddenly found themselves breaking the law. If they went and had a drink in a speakeasy, if they had a flask, all those things were illegal. And once you kind of get in that mindset that you don't have to follow this law, it becomes easier to not follow another law. And so that changed their, their mindsets. And, and that included some policemen. Um, they saw bootleggers and smugglers making a whole lot of money while they were not making any more than before and that they were risking their lives. Uh, you know, a lot more of them were dying in the line of service because of everything that was going on. So some of them started turning a blind eye to, um, to, uh, to smuggling. If they, if they got a bribe for it, they would turn a blind eye. They, some of them even got uh, involved in bootlegging themselves. Um, so if, I don't know if you remember last week we talked about a Southport police chief who had gotten his windshield shot out when he was ra uh, chasing bootleggers up River Road uh, and he nearly died. Well, 
apparently he got tired of being on the low income side of the law, the low income high risk. And in 1932, he was convicted of smuggling 300 cases of liquor and he went to prison. It, I think after he served his time, he was sort of welcomed back into the community and I believe he ended up becoming sheriff. So um, he did have, he did find redemption, but it just shows that people who would not otherwise have broken the law did find, um, find themselves on the wrong side of it. Um, and of course, there was all the violence that was going on, especially in the cities. You had mob violence, you had KKK terrorism, um, all of that was going on. In addition, World War I was long over, so there was no longer a feeling that it was a patriotic duty not to drink beer. And then in 1929, the stock market crashed, the country fell into a Great Depression, there was a, a strong need of revenue, of jobs, and it, there was a strong need to drink. Um, you can see this cartoon from the um, Chicago Tribune in 1925. We see this picture, this uh, couple. The, the man is reading the newspaper. He's very distracted. He's reading about the war news. He's in a chair. He's labeled the public. And this woman comes along, and her and her skirts, it's labeled prohibition, and she's tapping him on the shoulder and saying, will you marry me? And he's like, sure, sure, and without really thinking it through. Seven years later, um, she's now got this rolling pin marked tyranny that she's knocked him over the head with. She's holding a marriage license that says it's a constitutional amendment. There's no going back on that. And she says, and you can't get a divorce either. So they, the country was starting to feel like maybe they got into it without really understanding all of the consequences. And now they didn't know how they were going to get out. This cartoon from 1928 from the New York Times shows um, a camel. Camel was a symbol of the dry movement because camels can go a long time without drinking. Um, but here we have Uncle Sam realizing that it isn't a real camel. It's a uh, people in disguise um, uh, pretending to be a camel and underneath it we see bigotry and religious prejudice so that people felt like oh they've been duped into prohibition for, um, for wrong reasons. And then once more, the politicians appeared to the, appealed to the public's concern over child wel welfare. Before, when they were trying to get prohibition passed, they said, do it for the sake of the children. Now, when they were trying to get rid of prohibition, again, it was do it for the sake of the women and the children. So in 1932, FDR campaigned that on the promise that he would appeal, he would repeal the amendment. Uh, his slogan was happy days are here again and he was re-elected and he followed through on his promise. So for the first and only time in our country's history an amendment to the Constitution was repealed. Um, the 21st Amendment repealed it. Drinking was legal once again across the country, at least in the 24 states that didn't outlaw it at the state level. So we know North Carolina had outlawed it at the state level. So uh, North Carolina, in fact, did not vote to ratify the 21st Amendment. In fact, the government never even had a convention to vote on it. They never even met on it. They refused to. And to this day, North Carolina has still not ratified the 21st Amendment. So uh, because it was illegal in uh, North Carolina, even when the 21st Amendment passed, uh, right away, nothing really changed. Um, but so liquor was still illegal. But just like happened before, um, after a couple years, North Carolina began to realize that they were missing out on some tax revenue. Virginia and South Carolina had both legalized liquor. Most of two thirds of the population lived within 50 miles of the border. People had cars by then. They could go across the border. They could buy the alcohol in South Carolina or Virginia and they could come back in. There was still drinking going on in North Carolina, but there was no tax revenue. So the government thought about it and decided that didn't make sense. So they decided to implement the local option again, first for selling beer, then for selling wine, and then finally in 1937 for selling liquor. So we're almost ready to wrap up, but I want to take a moment for Kim to tell um, a story, one last story about her family. So Kim, you want to turn your mic on and, and tell everybody? Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, okay. This goes back to the story that you told on the last video um, where they had got um, caught. Um, Uncle Gus 
had great uncle Gus had a steel. Uh, they all lived in a place called um, it was in Longwood and it was down a, a road called the Gwen farm road. And the, uh, they called it the bear house is what they called it. And he had his steel back there, great uncle Gus. And he had told grandpa that if you're ever leaving and you see the revenue men coming to uh, blow the horn and let me know. So one day, sure enough, grandpa's leaving and he does see the revenue men coming. So he lays on the horn and uh, goes up and down the road, blowing on the horn, trying to let Gus know that they're coming. Anyway, they get caught and uh, grandpa gets charged with aiding and abetting because obviously he was. And during that time, uh, Bun Frank was a lawyer and he was known uh, as the bootleg lawyer, that he would represent the bootleggers. And he was a very good lawyer. And so um, Uncle Billy, who is the one that told me this story, because he was about 17 years old when all this went on. And he said that Grandpa went down to Little River to uh, to meet Bun Frank. He, I don't know, he was on his yacht, is what he said. I don't know what that meant. And he talked to him and he asked him, would he represent him? And he said he would represent him and Gus. So that was a federal crime, and they ended up having to go to Wilmington. They went to Wilmington, and during this time, the men, you know, they would wear overalls, and they had caps on. And all the men wore their caps a certain way. Some, you know, wore them kind of more forward, worn back, you know, whichever. And Gus and Grandpa looked a lot alike. They favored. And... Uh, Bun Frank told Grandpa, he said, um, I want you to do me a favor. He said, put your cap. He said, I'll pull it up in the front and push it back in, you know, in the back and go out and don't come in until I wave you in. So that's what they did. And when he was interviewing one of the revenue men, I guess he would be the witness. The revenue man was saying, you know, he said, who did you see running or, or whatever? And he pointed at Gus and he said, that's who I saw. And he said, are you sure? He's like, yeah, that's who I saw. So he waves grandpa in and grandpa comes in and it confused the revenue man because he's looking between them. He's like, wait a minute, you know, well, wait a minute. Maybe it was this guy. And then he's like, well, which is it? You said it was this man. Now you're saying it's this man. So they ended up getting it thrown out. So they got away with it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Kim. And that's uh, why, uh, but one of the reasons Von Frink has the reputation of being the, the Perry Mason of Southport because of right. that type of thing. So I just want everybody to, to notice Kim, Kim is uh, uh, sitting out there in the woods next to a still. She's got a computer out in the woods <laughs> My. with popcorn sutton. <laughs> I can't so, see it, but yeah. Yeah, no, it looks great. It looks yeah. great. She's, she came to us all the way from, uh, from the moonshine still. All right. So um, there was one other way. So after, um, uh, I'm sorry, after North Carolina made it so that local option people could decide, cities could decide whether or not they would sell liquor. Uh, Southport did not uh, want to sell liquor right away. They agreed to the beer and the wine sort of reluctantly, but they did not embrace selling liquor in town. But in Wilmington, they couldn't wait. So Wilmington got their first liquor store in 1937, the same year North Carolina established the uh, ABC board. But Southport had to wait a little longer. So uh, what would happen is on the corner of um, Howe and Moore Street, where um, it's, I think it's called Bullfrog's Corner is now, there was a service station. And at times it dispensed a little more than gas and oil. So. Apparently the owner, occasionally, he and his buddies would get together and they would take a drive to Wilmington and they would buy their limit. And they would buy pints of uh, whiskey and they would just buy only pints, no fists, and they would only buy a few brands, White Seal, Old Fitzgerald, Old Stag. And that's what they would bring down. And people who were in the know would watch because there was a car that was parked in the parking lot of this gas station. And every so often a sign would go up and we would put in the uh, window of it that would say, for sale, fully equipped. And when that was up, people that were in the know and who knew the, the owner could uh, swing by and buy a little bit of whiskey there. So that was, that was how it kept going here in Southport. So I'm sure you've all seen Southport's ABC store on Howe Street. 
that was the only ABC store that Southport has ever had. And um, would anybody like to guess what year it was built? So uh, Wilmington got theirs in 1937. What year would you think that Southport built theirs? Any, any guesses? All right, no guesses. The correct answer is 1957. So 20 years later, uh, it took until Southport decided that they did want to have their own liquor store. I guess the, the guy at the gas station was doing a pretty good job. Um, but even when they, after they built the ABC store, uh, North Carolina still didn't allow the sale of liquor by the drink. You couldn't go into a restaurant and buy a mixed drink. Instead, you buy, you bring your own and you buy um, a setup. And that didn't come for over 20 more years. Um, so there's a story about how that came about and um, it involves um, Miss Susie Carson. And so um, some of you may have heard of her, may have known her. She was the, the founder of the Southport Historical Society. She was also known to be a liquor shunning Baptist. And now at one point, a man named uh, Ormond Leggett, he was a fire chief, uh, he was circulating a petition to permit liquor sales by the glass in Southport. And he tricked Miss Susie into signing it. So he came to her office, uh, her law office where she was working. She was um, a secretary, I think for Bun Frank and, uh, and maybe uh, a, another a partner of his, I'm not sure. And she was working away at her desk and she was um, you know, very busy and he came in and he stuck the petition in front of her and he asked her to sign it. And she said, well, what is it? And he said, it's a petition to improve the quality of our drinking water. So she thought, well, okay. So she added her name and handed it back to him and, and, um, and he left. And uh, so a few minutes later, someone said to her, you know, Miss Susie, do you know what you just signed? And she said, yeah, a petition to improve our drinking water. And they said, no, you signed a petition to, uh, to get liquor, to sell liquor by the glass. And so she was furious, she jumped up, ran out of the office, left her all of her work and ran down the street and she chased down uh, Leggett down on the street. He was still out there, still chuckling over what he'd done. And so she grabbed the petition back and crossed her name off and handed it back to him and said, don't you ever try anything like that again. So he was still pretty pleased with himself. He thought it was pretty funny. So um, when he took all the names into the courthouse for the petition that he'd gotten signed, he uh, talked, told the assistant county clerk, he said, he said, you know what? He said, I almost got Susie, Miss Susie Carson's name on there. Uh, I got her to sign it, but, uh, but then she caught me. And uh, he said, you know, we all know that Susie wouldn't willingly sign anything like that. If you had brought it in with her signature on that, we would have known it was fake. He said, we, Susie is so dry that she won't even eat a wine sap apple. So. And Liz, I just want to make a note on that. Yes, sir. Or Ormond Legan was the uh, fire chief for 30 to 40 years. And um, in front of the e EMT station on Nash Street, there is a monument to Ormond right. Legan. That's true. Very good. <laughs> you should raise a toast to him. <laughs> so eventually by 1979, Southport did uh, get liquor by the drink. I think uh, all of North Carolina did. Uh, but I'm sure that they did it without Ms. Susie Carson's help. So uh, in North Carolina, liquor is still st uh, state controlled. You can only buy it at liquor stores. Um, Monday, well, it was Monday through Saturday when I first put this presentation together, but last October, um, they've added uh, Sunday. But you will still find um, there's some, there are not some things that you see in other parts of the country. So there's no two for one happy hours. There's no ladies night. Um, there's no discounts on specific brands of alcohol. And you can only buy one drink at a time at the bar. Now, they did change that recently. So if it's beer or wine, you can go up and get a couple drinks. But if it's hard liquor, you still can only go up and get one drink at a time. All right. That is the end of our presentation on Prohibition. And it's the end of our um, entire series on the early 20th century um, history of Southport. And as you figured out by now, I do like timelines. So I put together one final timeline. I kind of wanted to just show everything that was going on during that time, that period. So as we discussed, it was a period of intense um, immigration. There were 15 million immigrants that came in in those first 15 years in the country, I mean in the century. Um, 
and then that and other reasons led to the second wave of the KKK starting up around 1915. Um, locally, um, it was a period of um, domestic terrorism. We saw a lot of terrorism, especially in um, Wilmington, the Wilmington area. It led to um, the grandfather clause in North Carolina where African Americans um, lost the right to vote. Um, Jim Crow laws were implemented. Um, uh, across the country, we saw. Then we saw the the in 1919. We saw the the summer of 1919, which Red Summer, which was um, intense violence uh, in our country, where over a thousand African Americans were killed across the the nation. Um, we saw the second wave of the KKK. So there was a very violent period of time. We saw um, very amazing technological advances. So in 1903, the the Wright brothers had their first flight. In 1908, the Model T Ford was invented. Um, in 1911, the railroad came to Southport. Um, in 1916, the Amuse Youth Theater opened up with um, silent movies. So all sorts of, you know, we think about computers and the internet and stuff, but these were really huge inventions that were going on at the time. It was also a progressive era. We saw uh, there was a lot of social activism and political reform. So in 1903, Southport um, implemented prohibition. 1908, the state did. Um, the following year in 1909, uh, Southport started the Civic Club to improve things. Um, education started to become uh, a priority in North Carolina. In 1904, we had the first graded school um, in Southport that was, it was for the, the white children. Interestingly, I, when I was looking at this and I, this is what timelines are all about. I did the math. I realized that the students that were entering that first graded school as six-year-olds in first grade, um, when they graduated, they would have been the generation that was being drafted into World War I. Um, we had four constitutional amendments in seven years, um, starting in 1913, going into 1920, and there were some big changes. Um, income tax, uh, prohibition, women getting the right to vote, we had the very intense end of these two decades where there was, um, we had World War I, uh, followed immediately by the flu pandemic that killed 675,000 people. So all of those things happened in this very short period of time. So when we put this series together um, at the beginning of the month, um, we purposely put together um, a series to kind of help during this current crisis that we're all going through. In part, we wanted to give people um, something to do during the time that we were all staying home. Uh, we wanted to help educate and entertain and connect the community. But we also were hoping to inspire and encourage the community. And a lot of times when we look back a hundred years ago, people are nostalgic and they think, oh, they lived in such simpler times. If we could just go back to those days. But when you really look at the details of what our grandparents and our great grandparents were going through, we realize that their lives were certainly no simpler than ours. And in fact, in many ways, they were much tougher. And in all these situations, the people of Southport rose to those challenges with courage and grace and dedication and a commitment to, to work together to make Southport a better place. And I hope that in this course, by looking at everything they went through and how they dealt with it, will give us courage and optimism to face our present day challenges in the same way. And that's the end of my presentation. I will turn the screen back around and take any other questions that you have. Here we go. Street, how dry I am. <laughs> um, I'm to ask. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Thank you. Great. Yes, you. Thank you. It was great. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was very good. Thank you. What is your next Wait. series? Our next series? We're going we're going to be doing in May, we're doing um virtual tours of some local um, local exhibits. So I, uh, first one we're going to be doing, uh, uh, Debbie Malachek is going to presenting uh, Life in the Garrison. Her family, her grandparents lived in the garrison uh, for 14 years. 
And so she's going to be talking about their lives there. Her uh, grandfather was the light keeper on the river. And we have a, a whole room in the garrison that's set up with artifacts from her family. And um, so you can't go visit it right now. So we've got pictures of it. And she's going to talk about that and tell stories of her family's life. So that's the one coming up. And then we're going to have uh, someone uh, do an ex uh, presentation with Robert working in from the um, uh, from several other <laughs> and also what's the last one Bob I'm losing it the old jail the old jail yes I had it a second ago we're also a, a virtual tour of the old jail so we're going to be having those we're also um, I'll be doing a presentation the second Tuesday talk on 200 uh, mothers and daughters 200 years of Southport history told the lives of the women um, some of the women I've touched on in these programs but many of them you haven't heard of uh, yet and, uh, and then we're also doing a program on Wednesdays called Southport's Colorful History. And this is the book that goes with it. This is this wonderful um, coloring book. And it, is, uh, it has uh, line drawings of uh, landmarks in Southport. It's optional. You don't have to do the coloring. But we are going to have guest um, talkers come in and share stories about the different landmarks. And uh, people can learn about history. And if they want, they can also color along. And we'll be doing, next week, we are doing the Franklin Gallery, which was the first schoolhouse in um, Southport. And I'm- And you can purchase the book online at the Society's bookstore. Yes, you can. You can purchase the book online and we will get it sent to you. And there's three other wonderful things. Oh, Mary Ellen Cool is gonna be talking about her family uh, being on the uh, uh, charter boats. Uh, charter boat business and Pat Kirkman is going to be talking about giving a virtual tour talking about the uh, cemetery people some of the people who are are there and there's a fourth one that I'm sure is really good and I'm drawing a blank on it right now but it's really good the visit to the Walker oh, Pike it's House. Bob, it's Bob Serge. I keep forgetting yours. It's Bob Serge only talking about the Walker Pike House, mm -hmm. the oldest house in Southport. Liz. Where will we? Where can we find out this schedule? Uh, it. You know what? I'm going to be sending out links tomorrow, and I will attach a, a, a document with all of the information on there. All right. Thank we'll you. So much. And also today, the state port pilot, uh, or yesterday, the state port pilot yes. put out a, a really nice review of all the things we're, we're we have planned for May. Thank you. Thanks to our friends at Friends of the Library for helping us get that into the paper. They're, they've been helping us with the publicity. So it's also on our Facebook page. It's on the Friends of the Library Facebook page. Um, we've sent it. Uh, the, the, the colorful ha history ones are going out to the, um, the senior centers are sending information out on that. So we're trying to spread the word. And of course, you can tell your friends. That would help too. Liz, Thanks so much. I, was, I was just curious. It, 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 Vice, other vices increase during prohibition? Uh, I don't have any statistics on that. Logic would say that it would, but I, I don't, uh, I, I don't have, I see your question, but smoke, smoking or drugs increase during prohibition. I don't have any statistics on that, but I can look and see if I can find anything and let you know. Hey, um, Liz. Mm -hmm. Pat, I hear your voice. It's no. Kim. Oh, Kim, hi. <laughs> Hey, I don't know if you can see, can you see me? I can see you. Okay. Can you see that? I can. That's Gus. Oh, that's <laughs> thank you for sharing that. I don't know. I've got that background behind me, so it's kind of. Yeah, it looks like uh, Gus is out there with there Gus. He... That was great uncle Gus Flan. That's great. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Kim, for coming today. And You're for sharing welcome. your family stories, not just today, but for telling me them. So, because I've, I've I've shared this uh, three or four times now, and people always enjoy your family stories, and I think it makes it that much more meaningful to have the right uh, actual well, family stories. Thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it, and um, I've, I've, you know, I enjoy sharing the stories. And I wished I had, I have some, but I wished I had more because my Uncle Billy uh, passed away in January and he was one that had a lot of the stories. And he's the one that told me most of the moonshining ones. But um, they were very colorful characters, all of them. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions? Mm -hmm.
No. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> you may have covered this in your last uh, presentation, which I missed. What is the derivation of bootlegger? Well, the way the story goes is that they would wear boots that have a flask and they would put it down in their boot. Um, and that's how they'd hide it and then, and then pull it out to, um, just to sell it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Please, another great presentation. We appreciate thank it very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Liz. Thank you. And thank you. It's been my pleasure. I've really enjoyed doing this. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I had one last question. Uh huh, Donna. I sent it out. Um, the streets in town, Howe Street, Dry Street, and I Am Street, are are they from the prohibition? Because you know they run how dry I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pat Kirkman, are you still on? No, she's not on. Um, but, uh, uh, actually, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, Bob, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, well, actually, uh, Dry, How, Moore, they're, they're all people within Southport's uh, history. Oh, and no. in the, you know, folks, folks had noticed uh, how, Lord How Dry and the uh, one of the members of the aldermen, I believe in the 50s or maybe it was even in the 60s, decided that the little alley next that is now I am that they should name it I am for so you'd have Lord how dry I, I am. It was really, really quite controversial. Uh, yeah. There was, you know, the folks uh, argue, arguing the value of that both, both, both ways, but it's it's it stayed in the stayed in the community. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Anything else? All right, I will send out uh, links to the recordings to this and to um, Travis's recording this week and more information about what's coming up in May. And we hope we see you guys then. <laughs>